I, just from my own experience in Northwestern, I knew that there weren't very many schools that taught all of the elements of the marketing. So, you know, you have promotion management typically or channels of distribution, but very few taught pricing, you know, or, or very, very few taught product. And that was one of my favorite classes at Northwestern product management. So I said, let's offer that. We'll be one of the few schools, small schools, that can offer that kind of curriculum. And so I developed each one of those classes, and I'm very proud to say that we're still offering all of those. And our best students really make an effort of trying to hit that whole rotation so that they have that in-depth uh, background in each of the elements of the So that's where I've been heading in the last 10 years, um, and very proud of that so far. But what I really want to concentrate on today is what I would call my signature class, and that's marketing management. Uh, it's usually taught to our juniors. I call it our coming of age class because all these students will have had marketing research and, and principles. They know the principles of marketing. Now it's time to take it to the next level where they actually do something with that knowledge. And in this class, they are required to do five case studies, five real world case studies, one of which they pick by themselves and present it to them. So by the time they're done with this semester, they know marketing situation analysis inside and out, and they are doing this for all real world companies. So they've had some good experience. We also do a mock interview in that class, so they get some experience in what marketing professionals are looking for. And then the crowning achievement is marketing plan. And we do this for real world clients in our community, and we're a small town, and God knows we have a lot of uh, not-for-profit organizations that need the help. Let me pass around a few um, marketing plans and you can see the products of what the students have done. I'll kind of start these and then we'll see if you can see. This is the finished product. And the students get an opportunity to work with these clients all semester long. And at different points of the, the semester, like the objective section, the research section, the goals, and, and the strategy section, they have to check in with the client, have the client approve each step of the process. And then at the end of the semester, instead of a final exam, they will present these marketing plans that are coming around, and they're in front of a real-world client, and they're scared to death. This is essentially their first professional presentation. And I'm so just so proud of what they do. I mean, it's amazing how they step up, and these young people show an immense amount of maturity in these situations. And over the years, we have served 72 different uh, organizations, um, ranging from the the Girl Scouts to the YMCA. In fact, I have a list here of some of the clients that perhaps these are not the ones that are around, but you can kind of see some of the clients we've served over the years. Uh, and it's just it's just fascinating to see that the students take on these challenges. And sometimes it's it's not real clean data. It's not something out of a, a textbook. It's the, the, the organizations are imperfect themselves. They don't know much about marketing, and the students take on the role as consultants to try to help them through that with my students. So over the years, we've benefited hundreds of different students doing this, 72 different organizations. I consider it a win-win-win. It's a win for the school, win for the students, and it's a win for the organization. So otherwise, we're going to be able to do this. Uh, and then finally, just to wrap up, um, we always look at uh, you know the, the numbers. And these are my evaluation scores a little bit over the last 10 years or so. And this is out of a one to five scale. And you can see students are somewhat fickle, and they're up and down, up and down. But the mean score over the last 10 years has been about a 4.5 on a five scale. So the students seem to really be taking something away from this um, that's quantifiable and that they will always remember. And it's doing something good in the community. And that's what I would consider my, my signature course. And I think we have plenty of time. If you have any questions. Yes. I have a question. Um, I've done projects, real-world projects, and sometimes I don't know if we have one company, mm -hmm. companies. How do you keep all the companies straight? Well, we, there are four out of, the, out of the five cases that are assigned each semester. I assign four of them, and I put them in a case package. Right, but for the real-world client, are you sure? Oh, for the real-world client? Each, each semester, we have organizations that approach the school, and you know, we, we vet them and then, and then approve them. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, this semester, we're working for one organization that has two teams working on that organization. Okay. So two teams of about 10 students each. Uh, and they're kind of in a competition against each other uh, for that client. So yeah, we only do one or two clients a semester. Okay, that's and then, 
Okay, so it's one or two marketing plans. So this semester we'll have two completely marketing plans for one client. Okay, good question. I sign up for other hands. Yes, sir. How involved do you get in that class? Is it not too involved? Well, the good thing about being in a small town is that you know a lot of these clients. And if, they, if the students are on the wrong track, you'll get a call from the client. And, uh, or else I'll call the client and warn them that, you know, this group needs a little bit of extra help. But I'm, I'm very much in, in tune with the, with the clients and then I work with the students. They have to, not only at the, when, they, when they have these milestones approved by the client, they also have to present in the class. So we're all in the loop on, on where they're headed. And we take it in a, in, a, in, a, in a process of one, two, and three steps work. The first step is find out how the there is about the And the next step is to do marketing research on what the, the issues are that the client wants to resolve and the target audience to determine the target and then determine the point of difference. And then they share with the client, have a good by the client. And then the last one is the objective strategies. So, how might that differ from your marketing research? Marketing research is much more hands-on work. When I teach that class, every student is required to uh, go through the whole process of marketing research. But it's for, it's for, it's a real-world client that's not like a not-for-profit organization. You can go and do it. What's different about this is that these are not-for-profit groups in the community that really need the help and don't know much about marketing. And there's not much available. And you, the students are frustrated because, like, where's the market share? There's no, there's no source to go to. So, different from the marketing research class, and the marketing research is much more individual. This is much more of a project. Yes? What's the largest class size that you've done this in effectively, and what do you think is the ideal group size to work on this um, That's a good question. I think the highest I've ever had, and this is a great thing about working in a small school, I think about 35 in this class is the highest I've ever had. Uh, and in that particular semester, I think I had two clients, so two groups working on each client, so four groups. So uh, four into 36 would be like 12, something like that. No, four into 36, nine, nine, nine. So that's a little bit much. This semester, I think I have seven in one group, eight in another group. I only have 15 in this semester. So that's why I only have one client. Ideal group size, I'd probably say, would be six or seven. Any more than that, and it's easy for the slackers to hide. You know, and, and, uh, and it also makes it hard to communicate. There is one other thing I didn't put in here. I give the opportunity for the students to fire one another. One month prior to the decision or to the presentation, there. and it's a secret ballot, and they give it to me. And this semester, no one got fired. But I have had instances where the students will say, "This person is not doing a fair share," and then I break the news. Yes. Who determines the groups? I right. self-selected or do the term. I do. In, in marketing research, we get to pick their own projects. In principles of marketing, I let them pick their own groups. But in this in this environment, I want to make sure the groups are balanced, particularly male female. I don't want to have a, a, a woman super group or a male super group. I want to have something that's reflective of what the, the working world is. <laughs> do they all tend to be marketing students, or all marketing in some way? There's one comm major in each in each of the teams this semester. And it's interesting because the comm majors are the most vocal out of all, out of all the marketing students. So yeah, it's it's primarily marketing majors with those two comm major exceptions, and then I, I set the groups up and I try to balance them in terms of GPA and in terms of male female ratio. And with our small program, we only have 50 or 60 majors. I pretty much know what to look, how to balance them. Although it's becoming more complicated, one semester I had a student come to me and say she was worried about when before I picked the groups. She said, there's somebody in this class that I have screaming. <laughs> Please not put me in that group. And that was something new to me. I never experienced that before. So, so I try to balance it. All right, any other questions? You mentioned that you uh, let students fire individuals. How do you, tell me a little bit more about how you handle that. Uh, I give them the secret ballot, and I, 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 I educate them during the course of the semester. This is coming up, and it's going to be one month out from the final presentation. And uh, then I, I just let them vote. And on the ballot, it says, this person is contributing a fair share to our group effort and should be retained on our team. Or another box to check, this person is not contributing a fair share effort to our group effort and should be removed from the team. All I do is a simple majority. The simple majority votes that person 
off the island, I notify. So how, does, how do you handle the marking in that case? They have two choices. One is, it's right before the drop decision, the final drop decision, they can drop the class. It would be hard to pass the class without that, because this is 30% of the grade, this final project. So it'd be very difficult. You'd have to ace all of your cases in the mock interview. And, but I also give them the opportunity to switch to another group, to have another group take them in. And, and of the two people who have been fired, one dropped the class, the other one had the other, the other group bring them in. And to this day, he was kind of a shaky guy. I wonder if he exchanged money with those people because it was weird how they took him in so easily, but he did. So the two people, those, those are the outcomes of the two. One dropped, one got some other people. And I looked that up to them. But I have a question. Is that fair to the second group and that it's too late to fire him now mm -hmm. that they brought him in? Well, it's a, he does the same thing to them, then how, how do you? It had to be a majority rule on their part to take them in. Good question. I've done something similar, except <laughs> I do it in the first four weeks that they have to fire them. And I always have a live number of the group, uh -huh. so that there'll never be a even split. Mm -hmm. Good idea. So and then that way they, they have a chance to work on a project as well. Okay. So that's, that's a good idea. I never thought about moving that way. I'm always looking, that's why I come to these conferences. I'm always looking for new ideas to improve things. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sanjay, are you up next? Yes, I am. Can you help you out? And I did not choose that. So, the program. There you go. Uh, yeah. Okay. And activate the link. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, I saw there's a lot of interest in John's presentation. Guess what? There's something similar here, but I'm going to look at it from a little bit different angle. One of the issues that we've been struggling with uh, with WACSP mandate is assessment issues. So I do something very similar that John does. The challenge that I was asked is, how do you do any of the support? Me? So I decided to basically try to create some things that have been very helpful to me. And some of this stuff is still work in progress, but I wanted to share with you where it is right now. I'm going to also talk about marketing management course. So if you don't teach marketing management, I apologize. Two of, the, two of us are going to be talking. I don't know what Liz is going to be talking about, but uh, uh, it just turns out that I'm also going to be talking about the same thing. Briefly, I'm going to give you a little history about some of this stuff, uh, how this came about, um, and try to explain to you where I am today and where I plan to be into the future. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, I come, I've been at San Houston State University for over 18 years. Uh, it's supposedly one of the best known uh, names in, uh, in, in politics, and, uh, and, and, and you all know that the university was named after him. Uh, we've been around for about a hundred and some odd years. We were predominantly a teaching institution, and just like every other school, we have slowly evolved into what we call a balanced institution where teaching and research are kind of are equally important, is how they typically call us. Uh, for many, many decades, we've had a motto which has been very, very important to us, and it basically says that the measure of life is its service. And it goes back to what Sandy Sun was. He was a great politician leader and he was basically said that serving the community and serving people was his calling and so it became a motto actually it is the oldest building which was built in 1879 or at that time in the late 1800s has that engraved on the building so it was not something that we came up with in the last uh, 50 years or something it's been there and it's still visible um, how did I get involved in this? Well, I'll, I'll explain to you where how I got involved, but just to let you know, uh, service learning is what this whole pedagogy is called, for all of you who want to be familiar with it. Uh, service learning has been around since the 1960s. Uh, Carnegie has a class, Carnegie you know, classifies organizations based on what their primary activities are. They have research classification, doctors. they also have a community engagement classification. And I got involved with this from an administration slash institutional standpoint, mainly because I was doing this for a long time. 
So I got called in and said, you've been doing service learning for a long time. Get us this classification. So I submitted a proposal in 2010, and our university got it in 2011. It is currently on a five-year cycle now, so if any of the institutions want to do it, the next Carnegie classification is going to occur in 2018. So you can start working on it. The challenge you face is you need a lot of data. And so you have to do a lot of begging. Unfortunately, what I found is most people on campuses do not have the data. So you have to do a lot of going back and finding the information. In 2013, I was very actively involved and, in fact, was asked to become director of Center for Community Engagement. I have never aspired to be an administrator, so I, I declined. So they chose one of the other people who was very involved in this, and they became the director of the Center for Community Engagement, which is now a very active organization on campus. And the purpose of the organization is to basically institutionalize community engagement. So more departments, more colleges. We're now currently 20,000 students. So there's more actively involved in this stuff. So what is, now, when I was trying to start this out, I started using the word service learning because that's what the academic community used. And everybody said service. Service is the third leg and it's the, the broken leg of the stool in the sense that you always say, you know, teaching research and service is down here. So the word service in our university was not very positively perceived. So I decided to come up with a new word for two reasons. First. I thought it was a better word. I called it ACE, ACE, Academic Community Engagement. Second, we have on the website a fast link, and just like anybody else, I said, you know, if you're a fast link, you're higher, if you're higher alphabetically, if the first thing, the first thing you pulled out a fast link, it shows up like the second thing. So I said, you know, this is going to be a good name. So I came up with this term, and as a marketer, everybody loved it. So I came up with this term called Academic Community Engagement. Nobody really called it. People use that word in the literature, but they don't call it that. So I slowly evolved it into what I call the ACE courses. Okay? And so over time, uh, if anybody was teaching a service learning course, we didn't call it service learning anymore. We called it ACE, ACE courses. And now this semester, we have a total of 215 ACE courses throughout the university and about, I think, about 14 or 15 in all of the college of business. So, what is community engagement or ACE? ACE pedagogy basically is this whole notion of serving the community and learning occurring from for the students. So, it's a reciprocity relationship. The students serve the community, the community is involved in education, educating the students. And essentially, that's what the whole focus was all about. I was doing this since 1992. At Tix, uh, this is my fifth university that I'm teaching at, uh, and uh, I started this in 1992, so before it was even called that, and service learning was still relatively new, especially in the business school. In fact, the oldest article I found was probably in the early 80s, was published in Fire Business Faculty. So by and large, it took us about 20 years in the business school to adopt. It started out in education, by the way, mainly. So it slowly evolved into business school. And so I was doing this, and I've done, just like John just talked about, a whole bunch of organizations over the past uh, two, two, over 20 years. And, and, and like I said, most of the, and I can probably say that my, based on my current knowledge of all these organizations, I think 95% of them are still in business. So I want to say that I probably added some value to them. Uh, in fact, I did many startups also, and they're still in business. So I, uh, based on my current knowledge of many of these organizations. Here I was thinking, okay? A faculty member asked me in 2010 and 11 a very simple question. Why are you acing your, why are you, why do you teach this, use this kind of Why do you ace your courses? You know, and I started thinking about it. And the question asked was, is it really working? Okay? So I just went back and just like any academic, what did I do? I went to the literature and I did a lot of reading. There are two major journals out there, Journal of Service Learning and Journal of Community Engagement, and there's one more. And I did a lot of reading to figure out where is this pedagogy, what does it mean? And what I found was a list of things that they each mentioned. So just if you go to this list, you'll notice it helps students master course content, gives students the ability to translate course material to the real world, problem solving, decision making, critical thinking, cognitive <clears throat> development. Students find it more relevant. Uh, they sometimes get hired by some of these people. 
uh, present, they learn presentation skills, they get motivated, active learning versus passive learning, collaborative skills, communication skills, teamwork, time management, everything that we've been struggling to teach. Okay, I mean, if you look at an employer, I think this is basically, if you get, a, if you get students with these kinds of skill sets, uh, they'll start doing cartwheels, right? And that's just absolutely amazing if these employers are able to produce kids of this kind. So. But the question becomes, how do I know it's working in my classes? I come back to the fundamental thing, okay? The literature says, and what's amazing, there's about, in this list, there's about six marketing faculty who specifically talk about their courses. So service learning has been written from a principal marketing perspective, from a promotional class, from a research class, from a marketing management class, and so on and so forth. So what did I do? What I found from the literature is this connect. After reading extensively, what I found is if you want to really do a good job of determining if any of this is working, you've got to assess the content of the teaching approach. Okay? And then you've got to assess or determine the benefits students are getting from the community engagement project. And I found this new term that I had never done before, which is this whole notion of reflection. Okay? So I started reading on this more and more. And started, so it became this, and this push was coming back to me from administrators because they were a big push towards closing the loop, assurance of learning, and this and that. I said, let me see if I can help out. So, what did I do? Well, I had the content down pretty well. So, just like most of you, uh, and by the way, I have, I have these handouts, but I'll just for now, I'll just show it to you. I have a typical class, okay, which is a marketing management course. Uh, I use Walker's book as the main thing. And just like any marketing management class, basically they do a project marketing plan, essentially the same thing. I teach them every week uh, some concept and they have to go back and do it for the client. So it's basically back and forth. So I have all of this down pretty well and this is basically what I was practicing for the last so many decades, uh, this whole concept. Then, um, I too use John's, sim similar to John's, I use a competitive model. And so I had developed the rubric for myself and, I, and basically a compensatory based model where I weighed every aspect. It was, it was a 10 point scale where I compared one group to the other group. And I too give a carrot. If my, unlike John, he basically does this during the final exam. What I do is I do it a week before the final. The group that gets the highest or the wins gets exempted from the final. And in fact, because I have to compute a grade for them, I say, okay, if you win, you get an automatic 100. Okay? And this, we did this project most recently. This was, we did, we helped the Jewish synagogue. And so this was the results of that. And so I created a, a what I would consider a decent rubric, which basically goes through and evaluates everything <coughs> that, the, that the students produce. And I grade each one on a relative scale rather than absolute scale. I weight them up and ultimately I take that along with their uh, presentation and rank ordered scale and whoever has number one is exempt from Okay, So I, I had been doing this for some time, so I knew this was working. So I'm pretty sure that part of the model was fine. So the content part I had down packed. Then I started looking for the benefit part. What's the benefits of community engagement? Some of you may be familiar with this. This was an article written in 2006 where the, the authors introduced a scale called SELIP. Okay, it stands for Service Learning Benefit Scale. It's a 12 item scale. So just like any academic, what do you do? You pick up somebody else's work and run it in your class. And I was disappointed. Two things happened. I did it for two, three semesters. I didn't get the four-factor solution that he was getting. Okay. He basically said he had a 12, he has a 12 item scale, and he says you can eat there were three questions on each item: practical skills, citizenship, personal responsibility, and personal skills. I didn't get that. And so I said, maybe there's something wrong. Uh, and then I started doing deep, digging deeper and read the article in more carefully, and I realized that his sampling was very small. He only used a couple of classes. And maybe it may have been outliers. So I wasn't getting the scale dimensions well, and also the students rated me very low on the scale. So I mean, I used it, it was, it was a five point scale, and it seemed like it wasn't working. So I, I basically panicked. So what did I do? I decided 
to develop my own scale. And it is, it is, I called it base, okay? Instead of sell it, I called it base, which comes from benefits of academic engagement. And so what did I do? This is a student perception scale. I started with 12 items, but because I was measuring attitude, I converted everything to library. The original scale talks about the benefits. It has a benefit scale. So I think it was non-beneficial to very beneficial or something. I didn't like this terminology, so I changed it. And then other colleagues of mine started asking for it. So basically, I gave it to other the nine other faculty members within COBA, College of Business. That were, so I said, you also tried this out. And I reworded the words. The original scale talked about service learning. We don't call it that on campus. So I called everything ACE. You know, what did you learn from this ACE course and this and that? And then I added additional items. So my scale became a 20-point scale, or actually a 15-point scale. Okay. And then I ran this on a Likert scale. Let me just briefly show you. I have copies of this. But my, my, my instrument is a very small instrument. It's only two pages long. And so I've got the scale on the first page. And then what I did was I asked some demographic questions and some open-ended questions and that I put on a word cloud just to see what was happening. And so I was trying to look at group differences and this and that. So originally this turned out to be a, something that I needed. And so I did the first pilot on this. I assessed its face validity, content validity. I had about a total of 221 participants, meaning students, and nine courses. I got decent scores, but I wasn't sure. So next semester, I redid it. Besides, focused more on reliability and validity issues. Got a larger sample, more number of students. Bottom line is, I found two factors. Personal benefits is what I call the first factor. Second factor is what I call societal benefits. And these are the very specific items. Those are the factor loadings for the first item. The first item is about 10 factors. I mean, 10, 10 items first, and it has a Cronbax alpha of 0.936, at least in my, this original sample. The second one is called societal benefits, the five items uh, dimension, and it too rated very high on it. So I finally found what I was looking for, much more what I call a reliable and valid scale, at least in my eyes, than the SILIP scale that was usually presented in 2006. Then I started, I took those open-ended questions and did a work out on them. And one of the things I was checking out, so I asked this question, what do you like? Give me three words that you like about my ACE courses. And these words were dominantly, this is basically what they said. And of course, as you know, the word cloud, the, long, the bigger the word represents, the more number of times the word was repeated. Okay, so obviously, as you can see, fun, learning, helpful, informational, or the word clouds that showed up. Disliked, not surprised. You go through these words, time consuming, stressful, unorganized, difficult to do, uh, you know, challenges, long, uh, and so on and so forth. So again, my main purpose was to really give them an opportunity rather than scale it, to give them an opportunity to give me an open-ended response. Then I had some additional questions. I asked them two very specific questions. In the beginning of the semester, were you uneasy, what was your, were you uneasy about the course? At the end of the semester, how were you? I found a significant difference. I did a fair t-test on that and found a significant difference. Then I did some assessments, further assessment on two particular questions. And I was shocked to see how high the means were. Again, it's a five-point scale. Okay? And so again, very much on the right. So this is the summary. I think my base skill is more reliable. I've collected a third round of data now. And I'm hoping that it turns out to be the same. Um, valid and again i found two dimensions i found a lot of people talk about agreement and by the way my skill is not becoming university i come institutionalized the university is using it to measure social responsibility and it's one of the core requirements for education in texas okay. so it's those five items have become critical now that the assessment people have caught on next third thing i found on the literature reflections what is a reflection? The reflection is what they call the bridge between service provided and learning received. Basically, we talked about the content. They're learning the content. They're learning, they're saying that they're getting the benefits. The third part, the third link, is how do you connect education, what they learn in class, to the service they're receiving. That's the reflection part. And what most researchers say is, so this whole notion, 
we work for a nonprofit. We did a project for a retail organization that helps the poor people. Okay, basically, we collect donors. They're called charity care stores. We collect donations, and they have a retail store where they give them out. Well, this organization, my students did a project for them, did a marketing plan. But in the reflection, what I wanted to find out is why do these thrift stores even exist? Bigger picture, why does the empower these? which I think we never tap into. So that's what the research says. They call this the broader learning objective of education. Narrow objective is content and benefits. But a bigger picture is, why do we even have poor people? Okay. And that's what, so I did some research on this. And again, I specifically read a lot of reflections, trying to get my hands on this. And you may be familiar with Cole's theory. Okay, he's very well known in service learning. He talks about it. He talks about social responsibility being a big part, uh, and so on and so forth. He talks about reflective versus non-reflective thinkers. And so there's a lot of research done on reflections. And basically, what is reflection? Reflection is not a way to, for you to complain about the course. That's not what a reflection is. It's not a way to say, you know, I hated my teammates, I hated the project, I hated everybody. It's the whole notion of, uh, you know, telling people what I got out of this course. Okay, so it should help students learn the material better. It should help students reflect on the bigger picture. You know, why do why do people need help in society? Why do why are we trying to when we go back and go to our own uh, communities? How can how can they benefit? And so uh, I I looked at this a little bit more detail, and essentially I read a lot of research as to how to create a reflection assignment. And that was my biggest struggle. I couldn't find many reflections out there. So here's one. Here's a couple of authors who talked about that. If you're doing a reflection in class, you should require it at the end of your semester if you're doing any course. It should be structured. You can't just say one sentence, write me a reflection of your experience. Because what you get is complaining. So what I essentially did is went to the drawing board and created a reflection assignment, which I will share with you. This is a reflection assignment for the marketing management course that I've created. And you'll notice, you know, here are some questions I ask and they have to write a four to five page summary linking their classroom experience with the project. So, you know, things like identify, describe the needs of the client. What do you learn from your client, your opinion, and, you know, and linking theory to practice. Did the community service in the course help you apply the subject matter to variable situations? Do you think you have learned? more from this course uh, and so on and so So again, I did a lot of this stuff and I specifically have chosen some students' comments from the reflection assignments, which I'll share with you. And again, I specifically chose three students to show you. This was a Jewish synagogue, okay? So I chose one, uh, one uh, African-American student, one white student, and one one Saudi from uh, Middle Eastern, that's from Saudi Arabia, Muslim student. And they all worked on the Jewish synagogue. Uh, and But it was amazing as to what these students said. Uh, and again, for each one of these sections, I've taken very specific quotes from their reflections. And I have over, now I have over 50, uh, actually more than that, close to 100 reflections over the last couple of years that I've planned to sit down and analyze. But, uh, you know, things like, it's also a great experience to work with actual companies. Many students are not afforded the opportunity to participate in internships. Combining lecture, you know, just goes on. And I, yeah, I've got handouts. I'll share with you everything I've shown you uh, with regard to these handouts. So, summary is this. Since I'm running on time. Where do I, where do I go from here? Uh, tomorrow I'm going to make a presentation on what I call a integrated framework for these courses. And I think there's 12 critical factors, 20 <coughs> critical factors that are necessary to be created in this course. So I have a presentation tomorrow on that, then I'm going to have a presentation. I want to test base scale in other institutions. Now that I've developed it, I would like to take something that was a necessity, a teaching tool, into an academic phase and see if I can disseminate this more. Um, I've got reflections. I want to see not only what the students are saying, but I also, I've asked other faculty on campus to send me their reflection assignments. And I want to see what type of reflections are people making the students write if they're writing it. So I found, I got 28 responsibility of that from only 215. 
And I'm having that feeling that a lot of them don't get allergies. That's unless you are known that that's the third leg of this the whole uh, idea. Here. And the fourth thing I'm working on, right now my reflection was graded on the completion scale. Because I didn't know what to do. I mean, if somebody says I hated the project or the project didn't make me learn anything, does that mean I can't grade it well? I mean, I didn't know what to do. So I said, you know what, I'll just grade it on the completion scale. It was 5% of the grade. Tell me, answer all these questions. I intend to create a loop like this, where I can then do some type of uh, you know, discrimination on the grade. And right now, that's my next phase of, of uh, the challenge. OK, so again, my service learning focuses on three things. Serve to the community, learn from the community, and change the students. And that's what I try to focus on. I want them to, and so I pick one, like in this case, the synagogue, the last project we did. Um, Jewish synagogue memberships have been declining. Part of the reason is they have interfaith marriages. And so a lot of people don't know. So they were losing money. So they have a membership based on this synagogue. So what we did for this particular project is they had a social hall. I separated the social hall from the regular business. That's, that's what we ended up doing. And I created a separate business model for the social hall for birthdays and parties to generate additional revenues. And so now they released it. They were using the social hall mainly for the members. And they had members at birthday parties. I said, why don't we elaborate, expand? What difference does it make? Of course, Jewish faith had certain restrictions. You can't have shellfish and stuff like that. So we put that on the website. And now we are now doing search optimization. So anytime you go to Woodlands Synagogue or you're looking for birthday parties in Woodlands, the town next to us, it shows up pretty high. And so they have now got over, they increased their booking by almost 100%. Uh, they do this probably for this year. And then we created a website for them. It has e-commerce capabilities. And then we, that was my second product I did with Indian Studies. So we gave the ideas and we took it to the next level. So one of the things that I do is I don't stop at planning. I like to implement. Because I think planning we can do all day. But if you can't show the results, it kind of leaves it there. So I usually take on an independent study, I'll take on a second class. And we'll take the original marketing plan, and take it piece by piece, and figure out what has implemented, and we actually implement it. Um, so now I've got the, my main focus was on the measurement. And that was what I was trying to do. Any questions? Questions? How many hours do you have each of your students putting into Good question. Uh, the Small Business Development Center is the one that usually finds me these clients. They monitor these hours. A typical semester in the class of about 20 to 25, we clock in between 500 and 600 hours. So you don't major per student? Uh, every student has to submit. Yes, they have to submit to the SBDC every week. How many hours they worked on that, and the SPDC because they are a federal agency, they have specific requirements. So you can lock in travel time, to group meeting time, and client meeting time. So they have very specific requirements. The SPDC comes to my class and explains how to lock hours. So the total class project, I mean, uh, the, the total class spends about 500 or 700 man hours. See, on our university, we have been doing service learning since Durham was young, and. Our students are required each individually to do a minimum of 15 hours. Um, okay. So, but I was just curious, and also I saw a list of for profits on here. Yes. Service learning is only nonprofits. So if you read, if you read the literature, so because you've now called it ACE, are you then able to bring in right. these? And the reason I'll tell you, right. and the reason we do that because when I look at, for example, we did a project for a thrift store where this lady used to sell clothes, used clothes to, or mainly from maternity and uh -huh. children. So it's this lady, uh, and so she had this store called uh, Mom and Pops. She can never afford a consultant. So my argument is that, in fact, we have some profits who have some nonprofits that actually have more funding than somebody like her. I mean, I look at her books. And we're talking about profits of about you know for thirty forty thousand dollars a year. To me, there's not much different in those people, in my eyes. Is it our and, and, and again in pure service learning? It has to be a yeah. nonprofit. Otherwise, like on our campus, it's separated. It's service learning or it's volunteerism. If you're doing with a for profit, it's volunteerism, and we can't count that in our community service. So that's why I was wondering how you were able to. So by calling it ACE, you can slide it. 
And also to answer your question, the university is not required. You call it course, these course, it's nine hours for students. Oh, is that right? That's the that's the minimum. Otherwise, you can't call it course in this course. Other questions? I love the learning piece. I like that it's connecting you across campus, and whether it's for assurance of learning or for your own. Well, and you know. What started out as a teaching exercise has slowly evolved into a research agenda. And it was not because that's what my purpose was. But it basically, I was the monkey there thinking, when my colleagues asked me, why do you even do this stuff? How do you know this is working? And I basically, my, my reaction, anytime you have to think, to answer a basic <laughs> question that you've been doing for 20 years, that means there's something wrong. And so, obviously, just like any academic, I started reading about it. And that's when I found the three. I mean, the triangle doesn't exist. That's my own creation. I said, hey, this is the three pieces that we need in the service learning model. We basically need contact assessment, which most of us do a good job. We need a benefit assessment, and we need a reflective assessment. And so the only challenge, the piece that I'm still lacking is I don't have a good rubric to measure functions. So till I get developed, that, that's what I'm working on right now. Till I develop that, I'm going to grade it on the completion scale. That's been working. No students on the But let me just give you all the, the handouts that I, that I showed you. All right, thank you. Oops, we get set up. And the base scale is still work in progress, so I mean, you're welcome to try it. I need the. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. Good afternoon, everyone. We have a wonderful presentation. So far, I learned a lot of myself. It's great. Um, it's my um, very good, wonderful opportunity for me to share my teaching experience with some of you here. I have to say, um, I have been teaching house coffee for a year, probably more than five years. I could not believe all the wonder I had. Um, to me, it's a bit different from marketing management and one on one marketing. Um, the challenge is consumer behavior are very seriously driven. Students don't like it. Um, the other thing is um, how to help them to understand how understand the concept and move forward. How can they apply the concept in real life project? That's very challenge. So I have been thinking about this, and then um, definitely a lot of challenges. Uh, by the way, I'm sorry about putting myself to introduce myself. I'm also from Pennsylvania, Westchester University. Um, we have probably 15,000 students. The size of class probably 35, 32. I see the 32 probably the best size of class. So when I was still thinking about how do I deliver consumer behavior and also have students to apply consumer behavior, then I go back to the goals of higher education. So simply, I look at several goals. There are only two or three goals I think they are more important. Number one is academic learning. We need to provide, help students to understand the concept, but also how can they um, really have the skills, for example, critical thinking, everybody's talking about this. Can they be creative? Can they be, um, solve problems? Not just complain, they solve problems. Mm -hmm. And then intellectually independent. Start thinking about, they start their research on their own. So that piece to me is very important. The other piece we have been talking about service learning. We want them, we want to develop everybody's um, that kind of social responsibility. And we are part of the society. Can we engage in community local communities? Help them to open up, help them give them more opportunities as well, like we are doing. Um, another piece, personally, I think it's very important. How can I integrate classroom learning into experiential learning, which is very similar to the general directness? I think it's very important. When we are doing, when we are learning through the doing, I think the concepts stay and also we develop all the skill set, which are very important in professional development. So I kind of have this kind of big picture and that creates my kind of um, for called teaching philosophy. 
I have two pieces as a fundamental. Academic learning is my job for sure. That is our expertise. Civic responsibility, that is probably from um, service learning part. I've been thinking, how can I provide, put them together, can I have any kind of service project together and integrate them together, consumer calendar and students can understand the concept. At the same time, they can get a sense out. So I create, I try to find out any kind of service learning project. If they can practice, apply, again and again, I can help them to, be, to achieve the main goals. But those main goals are our education goals. So with that kind of big picture, um, I use my consumer behavior. Consumer behavior, uh, as everybody knows that, again, it's very, it's, um, it's very important for marketing tools, but I also have a lot of training skills in it. Interview, online research, and look how do I develop a good questionnaire. Those are very important. So my goal was very specific. My I set up a goal that I want to integrate undergraduate research into consumer behavior and service learning projects. So I was working for um, for private organizations before, but two years ago I switched because I was very lucky that I had a lot of resources. So I kind of use consumer behavior as part of academic learning as a foundation as a framework for consumer pursuit of platforms. The other part, I look for service main projects that can be you know, relevant to students' life as well. Uh, so that based on this, I kind of outline, uh, outline my research. Go back. This is fundamental academic learning. This is service main project. I, put a lot of time to create teaching activities. So students can work on it. And the end, the outcomes, there are several of them. Number one, undergraduate research. I was very specific. I'm still very specific. Uh, number two, hopefully they have a you know, nice thing for their resume. And also, um, speak responsibility. That's my goal. So I'm going to go online my stretch. How did I, how I have been doing? Um, what are the results? Um, what kind of because teaching activities I have been used. I'm still there. Uh, any kind of comments, definitely welcome. So, I number one, I need to find a service learning project that is appropriate for students. They don't have enough time, they don't have um, all the resources they can. So, I've been working with service learning office for a lot of dollars in a minute. And then um, I will look for resources on campus. I know you guys, I don't know how you handle your time, but we are so busy. And how do you get enough resources? Not just the time. Get the connections, find connections, find a hardware software, find a, maybe a system, a research assistant to help us. Those are very important things. Um, usually when I find a client, I will spend at least one hour with a client. Find out what kinds of objectives and also explain what is going on, and hopefully after the clients understand what we can do, what we cannot do, so we are on the same page. After that, I will design and teach activities for a service learning project and fit into personal behavior, uh, literature, or concepts. Then uh, I start, then I will have other teaching activities uh, that students can practice. At the end of the semester, I see the students or do a lot of things, and they can find out their own research topic. That's what I'm going to share with you. Um, I have some of the top <clears throat> pictures for you later. So, be more specific. I when I start thinking about this kind of project, I will go to have as many university have this kind of office of uh, service learning and volunteer program. We, they do work with non-profit organizations, which is wonderful. Um, so I get a kind of um, help. The other thing is, in our school, we have a very special program. I think that that's one of the to show you. We call, it's not just research assistance, we call community engagement scholar. So those students, they were from my previous consumer behavior class. They went through all of this, they become an ambassador, they came to the class and talk about their project before, and get students excited about this. So I we are very lucky and I don't think they give it a lot of money, but it's a great honor and also help the students as well. So 
we have, when I started from, after I have these clients, everything set up for the, resource, for the resources, I kind of go back to my basic, which is academic um, learning. I do it online, all the topics that are relevant for the project, which is not really very easy. Um, the other thing is, make sure the older will go through, will um, follow the integrates the process of such as an project. Um, for the clients, usually they will come to the, the classroom and give us you know, overview, probably the third week of semester, and you know, help us to get, you know, get going. Um, very helpful. When they come back, usually probably for the presentations. Um, I always ask clients for two, have two requests for clients. Number one, I would like them to choose the community. Based on the real world experience, not everybody can talk. So they have to choose. And their feedback are so important. Students appreciate their feedback. They feel their comments are more important than ours. I don't know why, but it does help them. Uh, the other thing is I specifically ask the clients, please give them a certificate to honor the community. That certificate still needs to be their resume and also, you know, that's that really is very important evidence for them. So um, combine all these together, I create some teaching activities. This is definitely focused on expansion learning. From all the activities I'm going to mention, I'll talk about this bird later. I have very specific teaching activities that go from understand the topic to the final presentations. The results are students probably they will have some research ideals. And I'm going to talk about the data missing, and it's very, um, very um, interesting. They have some kind of um, feedback on the times and better opportunity for internship. And also, I also try to measure their same results. So let's look at what kind of teaching activities specifically I have created. Journal one, it's a two page paper. That's it. Very simple. They are due, it's due before the clients come to class. So what they do, they just kind of homework going up. They look at the client's website, uh, understand what kind of what kind of issues they might have, who are the counselors, choose one competitor, and then think about what are the challenges for the clients. So I have a very basic idea. So clients tell me they can understand a little bit better okay, what's going on. Journal two, we have to both because it's consumer behavior. They have to interview in that interview, one to one, couple of students or a couple of public consumers to find out what are their concerns, what are their challenges, why they want to make a decision to volunteer or not. Okay. So then I also have um, in class exercise. I do have a concern with some students, they don't participate at all. So I always have in class exercise. When I talk about a concept, then I apply in a class. Students have to apply for it. Everybody has to work together. For example, I talk about perception. You know, we can create advertisement, but they have to do it at the same time. 10 minutes. <coughs> but I also make it very clear at the end of the semester, I run numbers. I run numbers. I'm definitely kind of scared to check on management. Um, I, for this particular class, I'm very lucky we have portraits. So students have to conduct an online survey. Um, they use SPSs to analyze the data, or if they don't know, I just show them how to do it. It's not that complicated. There are questions probably plenty about, and they do have some demographic variables that can help them to see, to show them how to do market segmentation is by demographics, very easy. Um, <clears throat> the end, probably give them some kind of outlines, help them to prepare marketing plan, um, maybe they can implement, I think would be great. Um, Definitely the last thing is professional um, presentations. So this is one of the idea we have. Um, N is the, uh, the marketing director of um, Chester County Food Bank. We belong to that country, but we didn't know there were so many people need help for the food until we had done this project. So she chose this group of teachers, this group of group, uh, students. Look at their face, they are so happy. They get a little certificate put in the resume. Another thing they did for t shirt, um, that's great. Uh, one of the students, um, Tracy, she was so happy, so involved. She even got into the shoe opportunity. 
and to me it was wonderful experience. Um, so I'm very proud of them and it's wonderful. So definitely that helped their career. Go back to the It helped their career. Um, that's very important. In terms of research, I think that's um, one of the things I really enjoy is I always encourage students to submit their research before we abstract. To, this is on a national conference for undergraduate research. You heard about this. Uh, 2014 was in Kansas City, um, and this year in Washington. Uh, last year we had a two group students submitted a paper for our second. One group student went. Two students went. Zach, um, he, she, he presented. Lisa, he presented. Um, Consumer behavior implication regarding nonprofit organizations. It's a service very project. Um, I remember Zach came back to me He lived in Pennsylvania and Maryland, never go out to big city. And he told me, I didn't know there are so many undergraduate students and there are so many different majors. And I'm the only boy, there are only very few marketing people. And he should be so happy, big guy, but smile, and I feel so rewarded. So I think that that's very uh, important to help students. They can, they have the data, they can analyze the data, and they know the nature of the project. Just put it together, abstract, it's very easy for them to do it, but they have the children of the project. So um, it's my, uh, it was my, it's my great pleasure. Um, this year we have another group student who uh, accepted. However, I don't know why they don't want to go to the We try, but they don't want to go to the project. Uh, but at least hopefully it can be good for their resume. And last thing, um, bring, this is a very important piece in service learning. Do, they, do we help them to develop this kind of social responsibility and civic, um, civic um, um, uh, engagement? I, my uh, C scholar, Samantha Lacey, she was a sign of hope. She helped me collect data at the end of uh, last semester. Um, basically, we use the majors from uh, um, the previous major, I um, worked on several questions. For example, one is the highest one. Uh, the question is about show me how I can be more involved in my community. You can see the numbers in the higher. I think it's below one point five six. The same, this is the same that helped me become more aware of the needs in my community. I think that's very important. They also feel I did make a contribution to the society, to the organization. Uh, I probably will continue to volunteer somewhere in the community after this course. So to me, one to two range is pretty good, and I'm definitely I need more research to do it. The challenge is the size of the class. I usually, last semester I was very lucky with the sections. Other than that, it's not easy to get the math students. Nothing. So I will continue work on this. Some of the comment, uh, my teaching narration, six point scale, and I think it's very lucky. My students like it. Uh, quality is back on time and then really enjoy the relevance of the case. I think that that's very important. Some students' comments, um, for example, I really like this one. Doing a project to help CCFB, which is the company for them. It was a real world experience. It was exciting to be able to help. It was exciting. Yeah, not really exciting to do this. Right? So that's, to me, it's very rewarding. Um, they like the structure of the class. I think that that's very, um, um, very positive for me. Uh, what does Klein say? This N, I didn't know she was our uh, alumni until the people later. She wrote me a very nice paper to send to my, uh, to my bosses. Basically, I'm going to quote her. Um, sometimes the university students can be overlooked as a viable contributor to a local community. So, but as a WC alumni, Westchester resident, an employee for local private, I'm excited and proud of both of my alumni in Westchester. I have to say, all the credit is to my students. They have done a wonderful job, they have internship, and that's why I'm, I think those comments kind of um, help me to think what can I do more, what can I, what can I continue, and that's why I have been um, not long. I have been Models. I still need to revise more and more. But I have been using this model uh, for just the front people bank for American Helicopter Museum. Have you heard about this? The museum was probably, you know, probably less than five miles away from high school. 
students didn't know about it. That was funny and there's a lot. We have this kind of music in local, they didn't know about it. Uh, we also work for uh, American Red Cross uh, last semester. I remember uh, the director of Helen mentioned that um, we have 73, 73 donors on campus. The most important thing is we have 37 new donors. That's make a big difference for them, and I really appreciate that I have help, I have different resources to do. But it's not easy to do service in the Thank you very much, and then yes. Thank you. Questions. I, I have a comment and a question. First, the comment. Congratulations to all three of you. I think this what you're doing with your students is, is wonderful. My question is, do you find that at all of your universities, this is the first time your students have dealt with service learning? And if it weren't for your classes, would it be the only time? they would be dealing with service learning, or is it pretty rampant across, across your campus? Well, but, uh, I've been, like I said, I since I've been pushing this institutionalizing it, and since we got the Carnegie classification, that makes a big difference in pushing this. That's what I realized very differently. Um, our director is very aggressive. What she does is she goes and site seeks clients out, and now she's developing a website whereby she's posting the client's needs on the website, and then she's trying to match classes. So she'll call a faculty member, you know, you need the courts and X. Why aren't you service, why aren't you using it? So you find that many of your students have already done a service right. project before they get into it. And one of the things we're trying to push now, which is something that is, you're seeing resistance on the faculty side, it is mandating that students graduate at six or nine hours of full of service learning. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to go to the back door and just like on graduation they get honor cords, we're trying to give them a red, white, and blue cord for service learning. They take 12 hours of service learning on their own because we have a HDM designation on our courses. So when students sign up, they see the letter ACE there. That tells them this service learning class, so it's self-selection. They can also have sections that don't so you can decide beforehand whether you want to do this or you don't want to do this. But we are slowly trying to make this a bigger thing than just uh, you know a couple of us or a handful of us. Well, we started with, when I did my first inventory of service learning courses in the whole campus, there was about 25. And now we're going up to 200. And then what we did was our provost retired. So I asked the president to give me the university award. And call it a service learning award based an academic community engagement award and has a five thousand dollar reward if you get it and so that has brought about renewed interest because now there is a target that everybody's trying to achieve so i called it the david Payne academic community engagement award and there's five of us who make a decision we know all the doing all the people doing this stuff and of course i made myself in the legible i'm not nobody None of the judges could be, could be winners, so but that is how weird. Our school is different. Um, there's still some suspicion about service learning, particularly in some of the fields like accounting and finance. They view this as kind of kid stuff or something. There's real suspicion inside. In our marketing department and our education division, there's a lot of service learning because of the nature of and what we've done in our program. When I started this 20 years ago, it was like, I was like a voice in the wilderness. It's very slowly catching on. All right, do you encounter that suspicion to anyone who does service learning? Skepticism. So, hopefully, and I would I'd like to do something to borrow your scale. Please do. Questionnaire to use that to kind of justify it. That's great. I plan to publish it at some point once I'm confident. But uh, let me tell you another thing what you're going to encounter. If, you, if your universities are not doing this, we want to institutionalize it. Keep in mind that was our focus. So we put it on the faculty evaluation system. And then faculty started having an uncle saying that, what if I'm not doing this? Does that mean I get penalized? So people always look at the glass differently. I didn't realize that. You know, here I was trying to incentivize them to tell them, listen, here, if you're doing this, guess what? You'll be given raises and merits and it'll be counted. Then the people who were not doing it started complaining. What if I'm not doing it? Does that mean I don't get my merit? 
And so what I've what I have come up with, which I have also planned to publish that later, is I've come up with a new a, a what I call a matrix where I've put service learning into the existing three three layers of it. So I've called I've I've put service learning into teaching, into service, into research, rather than call it four layer. And that has starting to catch some traction. And so I'm in the process of I have to first get this through to all the colleges. But I intend to somehow, somehow, if I can make that successful, and because when the moment you add a fourth leg on evaluation, faculty come work. I mean, I'm not doing this, and you're. That means if I don't have a fourth leg, I'm going to be hobbling to an academic success. Very, so you have to. Sorry, just in the interest of time. Any other questions? All right, Ben. Do you have any comments or anything, or any questions for anybody? I just I find it. Fascinating, just the passion that's, that's shared between the, the three of you, and uh, just the, the amount of work and real life experience uh, that you're instilling into your students is uh, it gives them a lot of benefits going on in the world because there's direct application. And it's not just I'm going to read a book and then answer questions to that, just the, the takeaways from interaction within the community and being able to do those things. Uh, has, just great elements as they their career. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I mean, it's one of the things that it's sort of, I, I can hear where, where you're coming, John, where people are sort of saying, well, they're a bit skeptical with that because, you know, the minute you try to put some, some of the real world side, they're like, well, are we a community college or are we a university? You know, we shouldn't be teaching, you know, that, you know, this is not a trade school place. You know, we got to teach them how to think and how to do all that and not worry about that. You know, and I, I think that it's it's a balance. You know, um, we can, I think we can learn and, and seeing from all three of the presenters today, you know, there's ways that we can apply the theories because books are only one thing. We all know that when you take those books and you put them in the real world, Sometimes people, environments, don't play the way the textbooks say they are. And it's about the adaptation of the theory. It's about the application of the theory, not the rote learning and the ability to regurgitate the theory because that's not going to help you in a real-world crisis situation. I think that you know, by blending the, the academic rigor and the, the theory but incorporating some of these real-world experiences, um, benefits everybody and you know it was it was interesting because I've had similar experiences to what you when you live where it's like also you find these people that were alumni and and I think that that's a missing piece because typically our alumni associations only contact alumni with that annual phone call when they're looking for some money and we do a lot of different projects with alumni and they want to be more involved and they want to work more with the students and the more that they're engaging with the students they're going to be a hell of a lot more receptive when that phone call comes because they're engaged with the institution so i think that there's there's benefits along all ends of the scale and you know the only question i would have is do you feel that these applications are beneficial to yourself as well as as an educator or just to the students or the institutions and, you know, or just I'll jump in. Uh, to me, I I did a lot of this first year project. To me, I think I get a lot of benefits. For example, I was working for the Center of International Program. I have a research about this area, and recently I served in Germany by college. So I think if I didn't work on this kind of project, I would never have this kind of chance. And also open my eyes, there are a lot of research that it can be good, it can be a non organization, and also help students how can they get education. Right?